Hello, respected viewers. So I'm going to talk about statutory uh, interpretation uh, this evening. Um, judges um, um, are not simply applying laws. They also have to interpret the statutes. That's say, to say the laws which are passed by various legislatures. Um, and so they have to look at the words and apply them to the factual case before them. Um, now, uh, interpretation necessarily exists in any comprehension of language, whether written or spoken, in your ordinary interactions. We got synonyms, homophones, two, two and two, and all the rest of it, a pair and pair. But uh, this is obviously at a more complex level. And often the word which is used in, the, in a legal context doesn't uh, bear the same signification as it's used in a day-to-day -day context. For instance, consideration with relation to, to contract law. As you probably already know, in terms of a contract, consideration is something of value which is given as part of a contract. Money or a service or goods, that is consideration. Um, uh, so the key rule here is that... Um, um, in interpretation, judges must try to implement the will of Parliament. But uh, there is much debate over exactly what uh, this uh, means in practice. So there is a leading case, um, Maga and St. Melons, uh, RDC, against Newport uh, Corp, 1950. And that was decided by uh, Denning, who was the Lord Justice at the time. And he said in the Court of Appeal, we are here to find out the intention of Parliament, and we do this better by filling in the gaps and making sense of the enactment than by opening it up to destructive criticism. Now, there are times when, like in the 19th century, when certain judges disagreed with that, and they refused to plug the gaps and said, if, if there's a lacuna left by Parliament, that's up to Parliament to correct. We're not going to do so. Um, for instance, the Offences Against the Person Act, uh, 1861, this means the person, meaning the body, the human body, so um, attacks on it, physical attacks, um, it said you can't kick, punch, slap, hit with an implement, stab, all the throw things at people, all the things you couldn't do. But it didn't actually forbid biting. And one man had his nose bitten off. And um, the judge in the case had to rule not guilty, direct the, ju direct the jury to say not guilty, in which case it is not guilty, because the, the um, statute does not prohibit biting. Now, some people say that's ridiculous, and we ought to just fill in Patently, it was Parliament's intention to outlaw um, uh, unwarranted violence such as this. There was no no um, uh, claim that this was in self-defence. So we ought to just fill that in and say that's illegal too. But the judge ruled, no, we're not going to simply dream up something which is not the statute. We're not going to imagine it's there. It isn't. So he's not guilty. That's it. It's not against the law um, because there is no punishment without law. And the other thing is you could say, but, you know, isn't that tantamount to, to stabbing in a sense, but using your teeth? The judge wasn't having it. Um, anyway, so Lord Simmons, uh, back in the 1950s, he uh, completely disagreed with what Lord Denning said. He said it was a naked usurpation of the legislative function under the thin guise of interpretation. That's 1952, the year Her Britannic Majesty took over. So um, let's think about the rules of interpretation. So the judges have come up with various different ways to try to um, interpret a uh, statute. So they've uh, looked at the provisions and down the centuries, their rules have varied. So um, these are not rules as such. These are different theories about what they ought to do. And again, there's a spirit of debate about which is the wisest and fairest approach to take. So um, these days, students often learn that there are a number of different distinct, distinct rules to, to just choose between. Um, and you pick your rule and you go with it. And other people use a blend of them and say, well, one rule or approach would be a more accurate term is more suitable in a particular situation. In a different situation, we go by a different approach or rule, as it's sometimes known. There's a Canadian academic, John Willis, and he said this is this is dead wrong. He said it's um, dubious that there were ever simply three rules of statutory interpretation. A court doesn't simply pick one and go with that. Um, what the courts ought to do is a look at the situation in the round and um, uh, look at whatever's uh, germane to the situation, other interpretive factors, and then go on that basis. If that sounds uh, as clear as mud, well, it is. All right, so the three overall approaches, there's a literal rule, there's the golden rule, and there's a mischief rule. So let's start with the literal rule. And this one is um, perhaps a bit pedantic. Um, say, we will understand the rules in the their most 
normal sense as they would be used in quotidian conversation and it's not for us to uh, try to uh, read the minds of parliamentarians even centuries ago uh, the words are straightforward we go with that um, it's usually there's there's no room for uh, interpretation or finesse no we're not massaging the semantics here we, we just it says what it says okay um, so um, people people have gone with this like Lord Tyndall J famously in the Sussex Sussex peerage case of 1884 um, Lord Diplock famous judge in 19 the 1970s Found of the Diplock courts and said, "Is you go it's straightforward? Okay, we want clarity. Uh, we're not trying to be too clever by half, inventing things." Whiteley and Chapel. There's another example of that. So someone was found uh, was was charged with impersonating another who's entitled to vote. So Chapel impersonated a man um, who had been entitled to vote before he died, but the man was dead. So was the chapel impersonating a man who was entitled to vote? Well, no, he wasn't, because that man was no longer entitled to vote since he was deceased at the time the chapel claimed to be that person. Um, therefore, um, uh, he wasn't committing a crime and the verdict was not guilty. Now, um, but now some people say, wait a second, we've got to look what the intention behind this was, uh, take a more purposive approach. A parliament's aim here was to prevent bogus voting and clearly mr chapel was attending to cast a ba uh, bogus ballot on behalf of someone who had died and those in along with us can't vote so come on we have to look at the spirit not just the, the letter of the law but anyway if you go with the literal rule you don't do that um anyway uh, now this approach was more popular in the 19th century when the notion of parliamentary supremacy was at its apogee now i come on to the the golden rule um the golden rule uh is where some people in the judiciary said, no, the literal rule is wrong because it sometimes leads to a ridiculous outcome. And we're here to do justice and um, not to just uh, be purblind in following um, these words um, when that, that would be ridiculous and it would just, just bring the law into contempt. Uh, so we don't, we don't want to um, be a party to something which is uh, ludicrous. So um, this is a um, taking a broader view of the, of the literal rule and Moving on from that a little bit. So um, one of the uh, prime examples of this is Riverweir Commissioners and Adamston from 1877. Here's a quotation. The gold rule is that we're going to take the whole of the statute together and construe it all together, giving the words their ordinary signification, unless when so applied they produce an inconsistency or an absurdity or an inconvenience so great as to convince the court that the attention could not have been to put them to use in their ordinary signification and to justify the court in putting them um, putting on them some other signification, which, though less proper, is one which the court thinks the words will bear. That's Lord Black Blackburn. Now, the trouble is, it's a little bit subjective. So they do try to be literal, except when that would lead to a stupid result. So they have to um, use their loaf a little bit. We choose them for their brains. A common sense must prevail. Because surely Parliament can't have intended, in that case of the nose being bitten off, to permit people to have their noses bitten off. Um, so we're just going to have to have to correct this oversight. Um, what would the reasonable man expect? The, the, the man on the street would think would not want the public to, to be suffering, biting, because judges are too hidebound by the exact words there. Um, anyway, so some people say... Uh, uh, this um, is not right, and you've got to stay with stay stay with a, a literal rule. Others say, well, um, this this one is uh, not so different from the literal rule. The golden rule is just a bit more sensible one. Um, okay, there's another example. There's an example of the golden rule in Adler and uh, and George from 1964, which is held 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 before the Queen's Bench Division. So the defendant uh, he was. Um, charged with a crime, which was breaking the Official Secrets Act of 1920. So certain people in the armed forces in MI6, that's the intelligence service, they sign the Official Secrets Act, certain the secrets they will not divulge. If they do and divulge them in any wise, writing, speech or whatever, uh, Morse code, any point in their lives, they can go to prison for that. Um, anyway, so, uh, and, um, so uh, obstructing a member of the military in the vicinity of a prohibited place was, was forbidden under this. And the defendant was, a, was in an RAF base, uh, which is a prohibited place under the Official Secrets Act. But it was argued um, by others that in the vicinity meant near to the, uh, the prohibited place, whereas um, his obstruction occurred inside the prohibited place. He was in the RAF base. He wasn't simply in the vicinity of it. 
Um, so, and therefore, it was uh, not within the remit of the Act. It wasn't forbidden by the Act. But um, uh, the Lord Justice at the time, Parker, said that this would be um, imbecilic. We simply couldn't allow that. Clearly, in the environs of a prohibited place also includes inside the said prohibited place. Um, anyway, so uh, uh, Lord, Lord Justice Parker said we have to read the statute as being in the prohibited place or, or in the vicinity of it. So uh, he was nevertheless found guilty. Now let's come on to the mischief rule. So remember, we've had the literal rule, the golden rule, the mischief rule. This is this is the last of the three. And this um, is an oldest one. It was more popular, say, way back in the 16th century. And this is before parliamentary supremacy became like religion uh, in the UK. Um, and Hayden's case, 1584, is crucial for this one. And um, it said, said that the judges must um, uh, think about four key issues when they uh, seek to apply the mischief rule. Firstly, what was the uh, common law prior to this statute being passed? Um, sorry, firstly, what was the common law prior to the statute being put on the statute book? And secondly, what was the mischief or the wrong that uh, the common law did not sort out? Right? So that's why the statute was passed, to deal with some mischief. That's why it's the mischief rule. Thirdly, so what uh, solution for this remedy is Parliament trying to bring about, to punish something, to prohibit something, to allow something. What what is what are they doing? What's the remedy here? And lastly, what's the real reason that Parliament uh, enacted this statute to bring us this remedy? Okay, so here is a um, uh, practical example. In Gorris and Scott, that's from 1874. Um, orders in council, that's a statutory instrument, um, were made under the Contagious Diseases Act Animals of 1869. And it um, uh, obliged people who were transporting uh, livestock by sea to keep them in pens. Now, Scott signed a contract. He was going to transport some ovines on behalf of Gorris. But during the, she during the voyage, some of the sheep somehow slipped off the ship and into the brine because it hadn't been fenced in properly. So Goris um, took out a lawsuit against Scott uh, because he said Scott was in breach of the Act and the sheep weren't in pens as uh, as mandated by the Act. But the court said, would decided they were going to apply the mischief rule and they decided that in this cause the damage caused by Scott was not within the remit of the Act. So he was not um, liable to, to Goris and didn't have to pay any compensation. Seems like he gets no remedy. But um, from, the, from the preamble of the Act, and indeed the title of the same, it said the statute was there to stop the spread of disease between livestock. It was not to prevent the um, sheep falling off the ship and into the sea. Okay, so the, the Act was not there to help people like Goris. What was the purpose here? The mischief the Act was trying to prevent, it was trying to do it was trying to sort out was to prevent disease spreading from one beast to the next. The mischief that the act was, was passed to prevent was not to prevent sheep falling off ships. Sheep and ship. Okay, difficult if you're not a native speaker of English, short vowels and long vowels. So they, they picked out what the mischief was and um, they, they looked back to the statute and that's why they arrived at this uh, ruling. Um, so you look at, at sources outside the statute, but some people are mm, iffy about this, looking at the parliamentary debate. Well, this is going too far away from the statute. This is politicizing things over much. So sometimes I'm too bright, sometimes I'm, I'm too dark. Um, anyway, uh, so you could look by reports by the Law Commission. We could look at the proceedings of the, the parliamentary select committees leading up to this. The um, white uh, papers, which is the government's uh, discussion document before something is passed. Um, look at any treaties it touched on, and in, in things like Fothergill and Monica Airlines Limited, 1981, they looked at all sorts of these extraneous documents, not just the statute itself. But again, that's contentious whether that is um, uh, a suitable approach to take. So the mischief rule has been around for centuries. It's less popular than it used to be because then we have crytarchy, the judges rule the land. And so what was the reason why the statute was there? Now, if you're going back to that case of, of Scott and Goris, um, sorry, I mean Goris um, and Scott, uh, the statutes uh, made clear, especially in the preamble, it was not here simply to help those who own the livestock. Um, anyway, so the mischief rule is seldom applied nowadays. Um, so 
people sometimes have a purposive approach. There's a, there's a fourth approach, the purposive approach, which is really an updated version of the mischief rule. So in the late 20th century, some of these came, uh, came um, uh, around because people like Lord J Denning were worried that uh, destructive literalism, um, partly due to EU influence, was bad for law. There's R against Secretary of State for Health, ex parte Quinta Valle, 2003. Bruno de Quinta Valle being a, um, a renowned or perhaps notorious uh, anti-abortion campaigner. So um, uh, Lord Stein said, the pendulum has swung towards the purpose of, purpose of methods of construction. This change was not initiated by the teleological approach of the European community jurisprudence and the influence of the European legal culture generally, but it has been accelerated by European ideas. See, however, a classic earlier statement of the purpose of approach by Lord Blackburn in River Commissioners and Adamson, 1877. In any event, nowadays, the shift towards purpose of interpretation is not in doubt. The qualification is that the degree of liberality permitted is influenced by the context, e.g. social welfare legislation and tax statutes may have to approach, approach somewhat differently. They've got to be a bit more precise. OK, so um, his noble lordship was saying that, that the court has got some uh, latitude here on particular issues and um, that uh, the, um, the thing about um, the European uh, Union's jurisprudence is it sways too far from the statutes and they simply put things in there which just aren't there and then that's um, judicial activism that they're just too creative and that's wrong they've overstepped uh, the bounds of propriety it's a highly unbecoming for judges to do that you wouldn't want politicians to intrude in the judicial sphere um, and likewise it would simply be uh, deeply um, unseemly for for um, judges to become legislators like that so the purpose of rule is it comes from the mischief rule, but it's, it's different in three respects. Um, first of all, the mischief rule is only used where the statute was used to um, sort out some uh, deficiency in the common law. And the purpose of rule um, can be used um, where there's an issue about the law, which was previously dealt with by statute. Now, second of all, going by the mischief rule, the court um, could, could look at the statute itself to try and figure out what the... Um, reason for the statute being passed was. And um, the House of Lords decision in Pixton and Freeman's PLC 8 1989 said, yeah, we're allowed to do that, the judges. This case was about an appeal um, touching the Equal Pay Act of 1970. And that arose from the principle of equal pay, which was contained in, uh, in another piece of legislation, was pursuant to the uh, European Economic Community Treaty. The, the main issue here was um, relevant for the purposes of, of, of um, uh, the, the court's judgment, the main issue in that piece of legislation. And so that was said to be permissible because they had to find out what Parliament's uh, intention was in passing this. They could look to Hansard, that's a record of the parliamentary debate, a minute of every word said. And therefore they um, bear that in mind um, and they looked at what the minister responsible had said um, before before the judge delivers his judgment. So Lord, Ke Lord Keith of Kenkel said the following, the precise words of that implication do not seem to me to matter. It is sufficient to say that the words must be construed purposeful, purposefully to give effect to the manifest broad intention of the maker of the regulations and of parliament. Okay, purposefully. So looking towards their purpose. Um, so uh, uh, last of all, the courts also um, consider the social reality of the situation. What was the economic context uh, when the statute was passed? So he'll be, he would be another um, key example. R and pig. No, not the animal. Some with an unfortunate surname, P-I-double-G, 1983. Um, so anyway, the statute said that a majority verdict would not be accepted unless the foreman of the jury has stated in the open court that the number of jurors who respectively agreed to and descended from the verdict. Now, Pig was found guilty of rape, but the foreman of the jury said it was a majority verdict. Um, and that was a quite of a new thing until the 60s had to be a unanimous verdict. It still does in the United States. And 10 jurors voted guilty, but two voted not guilty. But the, if you look at the court transcript, the clerk said 10 agreed to two of you. And the foreman did not answer that. So Lord Brandon then said, in a case where there are 12 jurors, if the form of the verdict states no more than the number agreeing to the verdict is 10, it is nevertheless a necessary and inevitable inference, obvious to any ordinary person, that the number descending from the verdict is 2. 
True is that the foreman of the jury has not said so in terms of section 17 of the Act. Interpreted literally requires. In my opinion, however, it is the substance of the requirement prescribed by section 17.3, which is complied with, and the precise formal words uh, by which such compliance is achieved, so long as the effect is clear. So I'm not going to read the rest of it. It's a rather lengthy quotation. So the juror didn't actually say that um, 10 voted guilty and 2 voted not guilty. Um, it was seen as affirmative silence. By saying nothing, the clerk of the court assumed that he's agreeing with what has been said. Now, um, the, the defendant who was found guilty of a violation in this case, um, his argument was, well, the statute requires the foreman to actually say um, that uh, it was it was 10 voted guilty because incidentally majority verdict has to be 10 vote guilty and two vote not guilty or indeed 11 vote guilty and one vote not guilty if nine vote guilty and three vote, vote not guilty the verdict is not guilty understand so the 12 on a jury in England Wales you need at least 10 of the 12 to vote not guilty um, Incidentally, it is possible to kick out a juror, even two jurors, during a trial and continue if they're clearly not paying attention, falling asleep, or they show some sort of prejudice. If you lose more than two jurors, you have to declare a mistrial, start all over again with a completely fresh jury. Okay, so the coming back to this uh, case, the court considered the uh, context of uh, the situation and um, considered how much the public will be served by... Um, someone who had committed uh, this heinous offence being duly punished. So in this case, it was a purpose of rule, which which seemed most apposite. Um, and we shouldn't uh, interpret these too creatively, these statutes, to the benefit of the criminal, because it just seemed on the slightest technicality, this person getting off. Remember the old maxim, de minimis non curat lex, the law doesn't care about the smallest thing. Um, now, you might say, well... The, the the answer could have been no. It's just the the foreman of the jury for some reason didn't say no when he should have said no, and we can't interpret doubt in favor of the in favor of the um, prosecution. If anything, the, the, the we give the benefit of the doubt to the defendant. But in this case, the um, the, the conviction was held to stand. The man served his jail term. Um, so we can look at the contemporary approach, and that is. Um, as explained by Greenberg, he said, it's beyond doubt that the courts must do and have always done in considering legislations to seek the true intention of the legislature. Um, so in this case, the rules I've had and abrated herein before are um, two main approaches to trying to figure out what Parliament wanted, a literal approach and a purposive approach. So um, uh, our friend Greenberg said it's never useful to be uh, too categorical, either completely purposive or completely literal. Um, so he's saying, says, judges construing legislation always have and always will instinctively look both at the strict and the superficial meaning of words at the underlying purpose of legislation. So I, I shan't um, give you too much of what, what Greenberg says there, but he says there is contextive, contextual progressive analysis. So people have always comprehended legislation um, mostly in uh, accordance with the normal meaning of the words as they would be used in an everyday context. Let's not get too fancy about it, too far away from words meaning what they mean. Uh, he also pointed out that um, sometimes the meaning is unclear and the courts have to construe this and try to figure out um, what were the main aim of the legislation is. Uh, we also have to bear in mind that um, uh, what purpose it was it was furthering and not interpret in a silly way which would really go against the spirit of the act you know uh, so the courts must be prepared to read it in that way a bit like that rape case I cited earlier above um, that uh, we need to know that there was a majority verdict and why well to serve the interest of justice it would be unjust to let this guy off just because the, um, the form of the jury nodded or something rather than said the word out loud. It was a bit negligent of the clerk of the court. The judge said, Set, tell us, for the avoidance of doubt, it's got to go down in the transcript. We've got to see the word. He said, yes or no. We don't, we don't record like facial expressions or head movements. Even a very vigorous nodding of the head, that's not good enough. So um, where a specific reading 
uh, would um, further the purpose identified, the purpose of the legislation, and and that would um, uh, bear well put too much of a semantic burden on the words you find actually in the in the um, in the legislation. Then the results got to depend on on the situation. Um, because we're figuring out what the purpose is of the rule or of the actual legislation and see what the words are. Um, we, we don't we don't want to go too far in other direction. It's difficult. Sometimes you might have to. Thing is, the court's actually got to reach a decision. They can't say it's too complicated. I can't decide. You know, I can't either. So this way is too literal. This way is too purposive. Well, sometimes it's a binary choice. So um, the courts sometimes decide that um, the uh, ulterior purpose of the legislation is not clear enough and um, they can't they can't sort it out without stretching the words to breaking point and they have to therefore say well there's some sort of gap in the legislation we're not gonna dream it up for you it led parliament's created this problem it's up to parliament to sort it out um, so it might all sound terribly complex and the judges have to be too clever behalf this only happens in, in, in a small minority of cases. In most cases, the, the, the prose in the statute is crystalline and it goes ahead without any faffing about, without any of these um, uh, word games. OK, so back to linguistic presumptions. Um, so we are trying to uh, deduce the meanings of words in statutes and um, judges use rules of language. Uh, these are rules of interpretation. Um, sometimes they're literal, but there's this, there's this presumption that they, you understand the words in the ordinary sense, but it's a rebuttable presumption. It could be that there's a very strong reason why we don't understand the rules, the, the words in their ordinary sense. I mean, I gave the example of the word consideration. There's a justem generis. I mean, it's of the same kind, or genus. Should you say generous or, or genus? I mean, genus, we don't know. Come on, it's Latin. Nobody pronounces it. So this is used when a um, statute has some sort of uh, generic list of items saying um, this list is illustrative and not exhaustive. There are other things we haven't listed here. Yeah. If it's a uh, we forbid children have weapons, which is guns and knives and machetes and hammers. And uh, the people say, ah, oh, but you didn't say an axe. But OK, we said the list is illustrative and not exhaustive. So an axe is not listed. But we could say, well, we can un understand this would include an axe as well. Similar items. Um, that's not a specific example. Uh, all right. So, um, for instance, there was the Betting Act 1853, and it said that um, about premises which could be used for the purposes of laying wages. And it said um, the statute was to for, applied to houses, offices, rooms, or other places for betting. So the Iostum Generis rule said um, this, uh, what's another place? So McCarty was the judge in um Mag, uh, Magenhild, SS, and McIntyre Brothers and Company, 1921. And he said, the test seems to be whether the specified thing which precede the general words can be placed under some common category. By this, understand that the specified things must possess some common and dominant feature. So what are we to presume? That is, the words which follow about particular things and the general words are understood so as to limit them to similar things. Um, we look at the, all these particular words and the, their shared characteristics. The words must then only, only include these characteristics, like enclosed places, right? So it could be a shed, if it's going on that. What if it's a warehouse? You know, what if it's a church? Is that similar to that list? A bit like I said, what if axes weren't forbidden to children? We could say, you know, offensive weapons, sharp items, those items which could be used to do physical harm to a person. All right, so there are other examples. There's Powell and Kempton Park Racecourse, 1899. Now, a man was better sit betting in Tattersall's ring, and the Betting Act 1853 came into came into play. So the, the law lords and the House of Lords, they ruled that the particular words, house, office, room, etc., were um, inside, whereas uh, there was another place. Um, could that refer to, better, to, a, to a racetrack or not? They said no because what's common to house, office, and room is they're all indoors. He was outdoors. Therefore, Datasol's ring, which is outside at this race course, is, is a permissible place for betting. So no crime, not guilty. All right, so another example of this rebuttable presumption in Expressio Unius et Exclusio Alterus, 
Um, so, um, so include the same and exclude others. That's Latin for you. This rule says that the express intention, the intention is actually written, is there in black and white, um, of one thing excludes its extension to other things. So this presumption is there when there's a list of item, but there are no broader words that follow. Um, the presumption is that the, that the list is limited in this case, and you can't add things to it. Parliament only intended to forbid the things were actually mentioned, or, or permit the things which are specifically stated. An example would be Tempest and Kilner, 1846, and this was from the Statute of Frauds, going back to 1677. It said that the um, sale of goods, wares, and merchandise uh, uh, over £10 in value must be evidenced by some written document. The question before the bench was whether stocks and shares uh, met this definition. Do they meet the description of goods, wares, and merchandise? Um, so uh, these are the only three items mentioned, good wares and merchandise. Um, and the Parliament said, no, nope, we can't add that to this list. Stocks and shares existed back in 1677, and Parliament chose not to put them on this list, so no. This, in this case, the list is exhaustive. It's not illustrative. All right, now there's Noscator ad socius. Um, so this rule says that um, when a word, a word is known by the group that it's in, you can judge them by the company they keep. So the words are to be understood contextually. Um, this uh, could be anywhere in the statute and not merely the uh, section which is germane to the case before you. Look at Inland Revenue Commissioners and Frere, 1965. The House of Lords had to, had to think about this phrase, interest annuities and other annual payments. And that was in the income tax, um, 1952. The word other at the end of the phrase suggests that the first two words, interest and annuities, were also annual. So was the word interest to be annual interest or just interest generally? The House of Lords said it was to be annual interest, okay? Because you have to understand that word in its context, okay? It, it um, garners some meaning from the words adjacent to it. There are a few other presumptions, um, but these are rebuttable presumptions. There's a presumption, but there are some cases where you can prove this presumption is unsafe. We have to throw it out. Um, so presumption against alteration to common law. So um, if there is um, no express intention to change the common law in the statute, it has to be assumed that the statute does not make any serious change to common law. There's a presumption against the exclusion of judicial review. Judicial review is a um, process whereby the court can examine what a government has done or public bodies and sometimes rule it illegal. OK, but the, if you want to exclude that, you have to be very, very clear about it. There's um, Annis Minnick Limited and the Foreign Com Compensation Commission, 1969. There's another one, R Privacy International and Investigatory Powers Tribunal, 2019. There's a presumption against the deprivation of liberty. There you need a very, very strong reason and absolute clarity if you're going to do this. Um, so um, Lord Scarman say this, said this um, in uh, 1983. If Parliament tends to exclude effective judicial review of the exercise of power in restraint of liberty, it must uh, make it by mean, its meaning crystal clear. All right. We need to be very sure if we're going to do that. That was um, about um, uh, putting two illegal immigrants at a detention center. Secretary of State for the Home Department, ex parte, Huaja. Um, OK, the presumption against the deprivation of property. So again, if you want to do so, you need to really spell that out. Leave no room for doubt. There's a presumption against interference with private rights. The presumption that Parliament does not intend, intend to constrain fundamental rights, except by absolutely clear language. This has been more recently applied uh, broadly about constitutional principles, fundamental rights, recognized by common law. Okay, it's called the principle of legality. There's R and Secretary of State for the Home Department, ex parte Pearson, 1998, and then more and more. There's a presumption against the Crown being bound, unless there is a very clear statement. Otherwise, the legislation is presumed not to apply to the Crown. A lot of anti-discrimination uh, legislation doesn't apply to the Crown. So the Crown could be, a, could, be, could be a racist employer, shockingly. There's a presumption against criminal liability without mens rea, as in the guilty mind. The mental element is usually uh, required by common law. Thus, the general presumption against creation of criminal liability without the necessary mens rea. 
okay? So a doctor performs a surgery, that's the um, uh, actus reus, the guilty act of cutting into skin. But he's got no mens rea, he's got no guilty mind because he's doing it to perform an operation. So there's no case to answer. It wouldn't be charged. Police wouldn't investigate. And now there are some strict liability offences, such as um, um, like speeding. Well, I didn't realise I was speeding. I didn't intend to speed. Well, I don't care whether you intended to or not. The fact is you were. The actus reus is sufficient to find you guilty. So presumption against retrospective operation of the Act of Parliament. So if you, if you, um, you can't make something illegal today, Wednesday, and say, and that applies to Tuesday, you did it Tuesday, it was completely legal to ride a bicycle, now that's a crime. That would be unfair. So if you are going to make law retrospective, then you have to make that very clear. And, and I don't, can't think of any examples in that's the case. That's about taxation and criminal law. Or we're raising the tax on your earnings for three years ago. What? You didn't give me a warning about this? Okay. And Parliament can pass retrospective legislation, but they very, very rare, rarely do so. Okay, some, some things are like the Job Seekers Back to Work schemes 19, to the 2013, that was retrospective. There are other ones, there's a presumption that Parliament intends to um, honour the United Kingdom's uh, international law uh, obligations, the treaties it signed. So this, where a statute is unclear, it has to be read as presumably making sure the UK is abiding by its international commitments, unless Parliament has specifically said otherwise. R and Secretary of State for the Home Part Department, ex parte, Bird, 1991. All right, there's a presumption against it gaining advantage from wrongdoing. Unjust enrichment sounds a bit like promissory estoppel. It would go against conscience to, to do that. We must not make crime pay. Right, that's a little bit from me. Toodaloo.